Hello out there, I'm Brian Spinsky from Lost Silver Productions here with a very special edition of the Game Show Talk and Fun Lightning Round. As I tape this, it is after midnight on Sunday, July 30th, 2017. And by the time you guys see this video come the morning, you're going to want to head to your local Target store right away. That's because... On this day, Target is releasing a series of 50 brand new board games, which are going to be hopefully big sellers for the fall and, of course, the upcoming Christmas season. But among them, you game show fans are going to be especially pleased because some of them are recreations of some of your classic game shows from the 90s. One of which we have right here, we managed to score an early copy, is Legends of the Hidden Temple. Yes, the classic 90s Nickelodeon show, 20 plus years after the fact, has finally been made into a board game. And we are here to give you your first worldwide exclusive inside peek. Take a look. Let's begin, of course, with the layout of the equipment that is used to play the game. And you can see just from looking at it how faithful it is to the actual show. First, of course, you have your instruction booklet. You can't play without that. You have your six team tokens representing the six teams from the original show. The game board, which consists of 12 double-sided tiles, with one side having a room of the temple and the other side representing a piece of the moat. So you can play each part of that game. You have, for the Steps of Knowledge, your Book of Legends, which contains 25 actual legends from the original Legends of the Hidden Temple show. And each of those is represented by its own treasure card, such as the Bifocal Monocle of One-Eyed Jack, the Broken Wing of Icarus, the Collar of Davy Crockett, and so on and so on. And even the Temple games pay tribute to some of the legends from the show as well because they gave you two golden cups of Belshazzar, two Galileo cannonballs, and 72 team cards in this little deck which are used to symbolize the smashed printing plate of Frederick Douglass. So they really went all out with this. And of course, weighing the Temple games, you get Pendants of Life. There are three of those. And for the Temple run itself, you have to, of course, avoid the three Temple guards. You might have to assemble the three pieces of the Shrine of the Silver Monkey all on their own cards and avoid any locked doors, which is what these 16 locked tokens are for. And then they give you two sets of dice with the game. These team dice, which are used for the moat run, and these number dice, which you roll in the temple run itself. So that's everything that's used to play the game. Now, to start the game, each player will decide, or team, will decide which team they want to represent, be it the Red Jaguars, the Silver Snakes, or whoever. And then they will all decide together which of the legends they actually want to crack and the treasure that they want to solve. Once all of that is decided, then the moat rounds officially begins. Before we go to the moat, though, a couple other quick notes about the gameplay. First of all, unlike the show, which requires 12 people to play in six teams of two, you don't necessarily need that many to play the game. In fact, as the box says, you only need as few as four players to actually play the game. So you could also play solo if you wish. You don't have to necessarily have everybody with teams of two. I'll also point out one little thing about the equipment because I promised my daughter Brianna that I would mention this. She said she only had one little gripe about the equipment that they didn't give you some sort of like mechanical uh, Olmec you know, doll or whatever that you know, to use to you know, operate during the game and stuff like that. It would have been really cool if they had added that as well. But hey, I will say this. The game does only have a $15 price point. So that's the that's a very affordable board game in this age of board games. I'll say that much. So, yeah, no Olmec, but what do you do, right? Okay, now let's get to the actual gameplay and start off with the moat. So here is the layout of the moat. As you can see, the 12 game board tiles have been flipped over to represent the waters of the moat. Each team has their own colored lane. Each team is also given one of these special team dice, which, as you can see, has the symbols of the six team mascots from the show. 
what will happen is, as soon as the ready, set, go is given, all the teams will just start rolling the dice as many times they possibly can, as quick as possible. Now, every time they roll their team symbol, like in my case, of course, I'm playing the purple parrots, I would get to move my marker one space down the moat. And I'm just going to keep on rolling with every time I roll a purple parrot symbol, I get to move one space further down the line. Now, the one thing, however, you do not want to do is roll the symbol of the team that is to your immediate left on the moat. In my case, the silver snakes are to my left. So if I should roll a silver snake at any time, well, let's just say I did, for instance. If I were to roll a silver snake, I would be forced to go all the way back to the start and begin the process anew. So you essentially have to roll your team symbol five times without rolling the one to your left. In the case of the red jaguars at the end, since there is no left, they would defer to the orange iguanas in this case, or in whatever order you happen to set up the moat tiles. Now, once you get all the way to the other side, you would pass the die to your partner and then they must repeat the process coming back. Now it should be noted if they should happen to roll the bad symbol, you do, you do not have to begin the whole thing over from the start. So like if they were three spaces in and roll the silver snake, you'd only have to go back to the return space. So don't they're not that cruel in this game. The first three teams to successfully make it all the way across the moat and then back to the start, those are the three teams that advance to the Steps of Knowledge rounds. Now for the Steps of Knowledge, one player from one of the teams that was just eliminated will now assume the role of Olmec and will be the one to read from the Book of Legends and the questions that follow it. And another player from one of the eliminated teams will now be able to assume the role of host Kirk Fogg. And just for the record, I'm not just saying his name just to pay proper homage and you know just recognize the original show. They wrote his name in the freaking manual. That's how particular attention they paid to this. Furthermore, it should also be pointed out that if you go and watch the old videos of Legends of the Hidden Temple, which you can still find on the Legends of the Hidden Temple wiki, if you compare what how the legends go when Olmec says them on the show to what's in the book, they are almost word for word accurate. So they, you could see what care Pressman took in trying to make this accurate to the show. So anyway... Olmec reads the legends, and then next to each legend on each page, there are five questions, each with two answers instead of three. Now, what the teams will do is, to be regi to register to answer, to buzz in, as it were, they have to shout Olmec while simultaneously either slapping the table or stomping with their feet, just as the, the contestants would on the show with stomping on the ancient marker on the floor. Now, since there are only five questions, the teams are only required to get two right answers in order to advance to the Temple Games. And the first two teams to do it are the ones that advance. Now it's time for the Temple Games. Now, just like the show, the Temple Games earn you Pendants of Life to use in the Temple itself. Now, as you saw in the equipment, there are no half Pendants of Life in this, so there's another subtle change. Each game plays for a full Pendant, so that means once a team's won two Temple Games, that's it. It's over. You can officially go to the Temple Run. You may not need to play the third if there's a sweep, but you may want it for sport anyway, just for the fun of it. Let's take a look at what each of the three Temple Games looks like, starting with the Golden Cup of Belshazzar. So there you see the cup as it is, and you can see it's been positioned face up, just hanging over the edge of the table. If this looks a little familiar to you, it should. I'm sure a lot of you have played Flip Cup out there. Let's see if I'm any good at it. Oh, I almost got it there. Well, you know exactly what it is that you're trying to do. You're trying to get the cup to land like that in some capacity. Each team member has to be able to do that one time. First team to have both members successfully get the cup to flip like that, and they'll be racing to do it, of course, wins and gets the first Pendant of Life. The second Temple game is Galileo's Cannonball. Now for this, you'll again take the Golden Cups of Belshazzar one more time, and to weigh them down, they instruct you to take one of the team dice and play, or any of the dice, doesn't really matter, and place it within the cup. That's to keep it in place. The object of Galileo's Cannonball um, is kind of like a certain Pong that some college and adult kids play because you basically have to take uh, the Galileo's Cannonball and bounce it on the table and try to 
lands it in the cup without the cup turning over, which, as you can see, may not be the easiest thing. Oh, there it is. So that's how you get it to work. The teams have to perform this twice with each person succeeding in the task one time. The first team to do that gets the second pendant of life. The third and final temple game, if it needs to be played, is the smashed printing plate of Frederick Douglass. For this, you will use the 72 team cards. On these cards, some of them have been printed correctly, like this green monkeys card that you see here. But some, like this purple parrots card that says red jaguars, have not. One player and only one player from each team will sit at opposite ends of the table. Kirk Fogg will sit in a neutral third position. After shuffling the deck, Kirk will then deal out the cards one at a time, face up, in a stack. Now, each player needs to watch very closely and look for a card that has been printed correctly, like this Silver Snakes card. The instant that they see a card that is printed correctly, they must be the first to slap over the cards to capture them. If they do it correctly like that, they take all the cards in the stack as their own. But you have to be careful because if you make a mistake and slap on a card that has not been printed correctly, like this blue Barracuda orange iguana card, if you make a mistake, you automatically forfeit those cards to your opponent. You go through the entire deck of 72 cards like this. Once the deck is done, each side counts up how many cards they have, and whoever's got more is the team that captures the third and final pendant of life. After that, whoever has won the best two out of three, that is the team that goes on to the temple run. And now for the part of the game that people remember most from Legends of the Hidden Temple, the Temple Run. Each of the 12 game board tiles on the flip side from the moat has one of the 12 rooms from the original Hidden Temple, mostly from the first season. They gave us the Room of the Three Gargoyles, the Treasure Room, the Throne Room, the Swamp, the Shrine of the Silver Monkey, the Pit of Despair, the Pirate's Cove, the Observatory, the Heart Room, the dungeon, the dark forest, the only season two room that they gave in this pack, and the cave of size, of course. Okay, now here's where things really get different from how they were on the actual show. The winners will be sent out of the room while the losing teams set up the temple. They'll first take the 12 temple cards and they'll arrange them in whatever six by two order that they wish to. There's no official arrangement as to how the room cards are supposed to go, so you can literally create a new temple arrangement every single time you play. Now, what those losing teams will then do is they'll take the three numbered dice that were provided and they will roll them. Every one of the cards has a number in the bottom corner, like you can see the five at the bottom of the observatory there. Whatever total the dice show, that indicates what room you place a temple guard under. Like, for instance, one, three, and three, I rolled a seven. So we'll take a Temple Guard card and we'll place it under, okay, the treasure room is a seven, so we'll put a Temple Guard under there. Now we do the same with the other three, uh, other two Temple Guard cards. Okay, there's an eight. So let's see, the, uh, the Shrine of the Silver Monkey is an eight, so we'll put one right there. Okay, and then one more here. Here, which okay, we got one, three, three, another seven. Okay, so there's the we'll do under the throne room then. So we'll do that. Now you do now the losing team will do the same thing to determine where the treasure for this particular quest is going to be. And it is possible, the rules say you are allowed, if the, the rolls of the dice appear this way, to put a treasure in the same room as a temple guard. Another significant difference from the show. Okay, in this case I rolled a three, and the only three is the cave of size. So it's going to go right in there. So the thing is, the winning team has no clue not only where the temple guards are, but they don't know where the treasure is supposed to be either. So that's a significant uh, thing to consider. Okay, so winning team comes back into the room now that the temple is in place. Now, the winning team will take their token and they will place it right here at the start of the temple. According to the rules, the start of the temple is the bottom left corner, not the bottom right corner like it is on the show. So just get used to that uh, visual flip for yourself. Now to play this, you need an actual three minute timer. You are really playing this under the clock. Now, fortunately, every 
cell phone now has a three minute timer so you don't have to worry about uh, scrambling for any anything else but that so and with so the team will starting with the first runner will take the three uh, dice to determine the movement that they will make and with the first roll the clock officially starts now as the teams enter each new room they'll lift the card to see if there's a temple guard happen to be hidden under there if there is of course like the show if you've got a pendant of life you move on if you don't have a pendant of life then you're ejected from the temple you have to go back to start and then your partner will then proceed to uh, take their turn at the temple and by the way a little interesting uh, side note within the rules about the pendants of life the rules actually say that it's possible to come into the temple run with only one pendant or with all three, which sounds kind of strange because of the fact that you were playing the temple games best two out of three in the first place. So who knows about that? That was probably just an oversight on Pressman's part. But anyway, back to the story. So when you roll the dice, just like every other board game you've ever played, every square counts as one piece of movement. And you can't go over an obstruction that's in the room. Like, you can't go over the sundial in the observatory or the treasure chest or the ship's wheels in the pirate's cove. You have to work your way around them. So you keep moving until you reach a door. Now, when you get to a door, you have to try to get it to open like it is on the show. The way you do that is, again, to roll the three dice. The object is, in order for a door to open, all three dice have to show the same color. You have to get three reds or three yellows. Now, if you get two of one and one of the other, you can re-roll re the odd die, Yahtzee style, as many times as necessary until you get its color to match the others. Once you do that, the door is open, and then you can proceed to start rolling again to proceed to the next room. So that's how that goes. Now, as I said before, I roll the dice again to move into the Shrine of the Silver Monkey. I check under. Uh-oh, there's a Temple Guard. Fortunately, I have my pendant, so I can move on with impunity in that case. But that puts me in danger of the next Temple Guard, of course. Now, it, what's funny, of course, when you get into the Shrine of the Silver Monkey is... There is an actual silver monkey to put together. That's in the form of the three silver monkey cards that are right here. Now, the losing players have arranged them or shuffled them in whatever fashion they want. But as soon as you get into the Shrine of the Silver Monkey, you have to immediately grab those cards and... Oh, quick. All right. Okay, wait. There's the head. Okay, wait, wait. Let's still go. Okay, wait. There's the base. And, uh, okay, there's the body. Boom. There's the, there's the silver monkey. So now the monkey is put together. I can officially move on. So... It's a lot less annoying, of course, to put this silver monkey together than uh, was for the kids on the real show. Make of that what you will. But at least they made sure to even stay true to that and make sure that this damn monkey is still there as part of the festivities. So once you assemble it, then you can continue as you did before, where you can proceed to make, make your movements and again try to roll and open doors and things like that. Now... Like the show, if you get into a room and there's a temple guard and you have no pendant to defend yourself, you must, of course, be ejected from the temple and return to start. There is, however, in this game, one other way that you can get ejected from the temple, and it's a very different and significant rule. And this is where the lock tokens come into play. When you are trying to open any particular doors. Like, let's say I'm in the treasure room. Let's say I want to move across to the Pirate's Cove in this case. If I, when I go to roll the dice, if at any point, even if the colors match, if at any point the total of the three dice comes out to an eight or a nine, the two highest possible rolls, that door is officially declared locked. And I have to take a lock token and place it there, which means I cannot pass that way and I have to start rolling again to get to another door. Now let's say if that happened there, so okay, I try to detour myself to the dungeon, and let's say as I roll the dice again, I am also unfortunate to roll an eight or a nine total in the dice and lock myself that way. I have now officially dead-ended myself in the treasure room. According to the rules, if you dead-end yourself, that is also considered an ejection from the temple, and you have to go back to the start that so that is that's a very significant rule change however now I'll grant you this 
The dice only show ones, twos, and threes. It's very difficult mathematically to roll that total on the three dice or whatever. So you won't probably have to worry about the locks so much in place or whatever. You should be able to open most stores. But given that additional rule, and plus the fact that it might take a little bit to get the three dice if you're unlucky and you get two yellows, but you keep getting reds on the third one or whatever, this may make the temple run in this game actually harder than any temple run that any real players did on the actual show. Especially also considering the fact that the players running through don't know where the treasure is actually supposed to be located. The fact that they're flying totally blind like that. So make of that what you will if you think that uh, is a fair trade-off for the experience. And then of course, like the show, if you happen to reach the room where the treasure happens to be located, you enter, you pick up the tab, and oh gee, there's the secret battle plan of Nathan Hale. All the doors are open now, so all the locks go away. You don't have to worry about temple guards anymore. But what you do still have to do is, oh no, you probably only have a, a 30 seconds left or whatever. you got to start rolling and booking it like hell out of the temple and hope that your rolls are high enough to be able to make your way out unfortunately i'm only rolling fours and fives so probably no chance that i'm going to make it out in time but who knows depending on how quickly you find it and you never know because of dumb luck the tre the treasure might get rolled into one of the first rooms which can make a temple run really quick too you have no idea when you play these out it's just literally the luck of how the dice roll how the temple is laid out, and so on and so forth. And that's it. That's how Legends of the Hidden Temple, the home game, works. Personally, I think they did a fantastic job with trying to take all the elements from the show and recreate them into a home game format. Of course, like every other game show converted to home game, a couple of liberties were taken, a couple of rules had to change. It always happens. And believe me, I know some of you hardcores out there are probably going to change the rules back to suit your tastes. That's, of course, totally your prerogative. But personally, I think between the way that all of the tokens and the tiles and everything looks, the way they took the legends from the show and kept them accurate to the way they told them on the show and everything else. This was extremely a highly well done adaptation. So I strongly urge you guys, as soon as you see this video first thing in the morning, this and tons of other board games will be available at your target stores officially. Go out right away, get Legends of the Hidden Temple and bring it home, and enjoy it with your friends and family. And as soon as you do, let us know what you think of the game. We want to hear how you liked the game, or if you didn't like the game, leave a comment down below and tell us exactly what you thought. And, of course, be sure along the way to like this channel, subscribe to us here on YouTube, on Facebook, at facebook.com slash lostsilverproductions, and get us at our new Twitter handle, at Game Show Megamix, for exclusive news and content that you won't get anywhere else. And, hey, if you want us to do more board game reviews, more video game reviews, more anime reviews, we're apt to want to do them. We're anxious to do them. So please, let us know. We want this to be your channel as much as ours. I had a lot of fun doing this review. I'd love to do more in the future, and so would the rest of the guys. So come back and join us for more sometime soon. Until then, you have survived the lightning rounds. My name is Brian Sapinski from Lost Silver Productions, and we'll see you soon.